of you, lucky enough, will get one copy of Sylvester and the Magic Pebble. So you know you're never too old, too wacky, too wild to pick up a book and read to a child. And we also know that children are made readers on the laps of their parents, grandparents, and neighbors and friends. So our goal, our goal <laughs> is to make sure that we have readers in our county, in our Title I schools, that love reading this much. so that they have a better understanding. So now I know that which set of these rocks are unusual. Yeah? Very good. So we know that what Sylvester likes to pick out are the ones that are here, right? So think about it. Do you think having that visual and having that understanding, that child will be able to use that word again later on? 
or maybe he'll talk about you know something that he saw that was unusual because he has that visual. All right. So on a rainy Saturday during vacation, he found a quite extraordinary one. Mm. It was flaming red, shiny, and perfectly round like a marble. As he was studying this remarkable pebble, he began to shiver, probably from excitement, and the rain felt cold on his back. I wish it would stop raining, he said. So I'm going to stop there, and we're going to talk about extraordinary. So I know the meaning of extraordinary is very unusual or special, right? So then I want a visual. So I'm going to tell him, or, or whoever I'm reading to, Here's a bowl of fruit. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty ordinary. But now look at this bowl of fruit. That is extraordinary, right? Uh, now I have a visual of, of, of what he, this rock that he found, this pebble that he found. It must be pretty, pretty awesome. It's pretty extraordinary. To his great surprise, the rain stopped. It didn't stop gradually, as rain usually does. It ceased. I don't have a picture to show you for cease, but I can certainly show you with my hands, right? It ceased. We know that it stopped suddenly. The drops vanished on the way down. The clouds disappeared. Everything was dry. And the sun was shining as if the rain had never existed. So what do you think? It must be something pretty unusual about that rock, huh? In all of his young life, Sylvester had never had a wish gratified so quickly. It struck him that magic must be at work. And he guessed that the magic must be in the remarkable looking red pebble, where indeed it was. To make a test, he put the pebble on the ground. And he said, I wish it would rain again. Nothing happened. But when he said the same thing, holding the pebble in, in his hoof, the sky turned black, there was lightning and a clap of thunder, and the rain came shooting down. What a lucky day this is, thought Sylvester. From now on, I can have anything I want. My father and mother can have anything they want. My relatives, my friends, and anybody at all can have anything anybody wants. He wished the sunshine back in the sky, and he wished a wart on his left hind fetlock would disappear. Fetlock. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah? Cool. What is it? That like it's part of a horse and so it's part of a horse. How do you know that? Because I have horses. Aha! I don't have horses. Did you know what that was, Mr. Wells? Nope. You don't have horses, right? So would that be something you might want to look up real quick? I did when I first read the book to figure out that it was part of the horse. And that, wow, the vocabulary that that child would have now uh, that, that they didn't have before if they didn't have experiences with, with animals like that. And it also gives them an idea where he's talking about, too, where he had that book. And he started home, eager to amaze his father and mother with his magic pebble. He could hardly wait to see their faces. Maybe they wouldn't even believe him at first. All right. As he was crossing Strawberry Hill, thinking of some of the many, many things he could wish for, he started to see a mean, hungry lion looking at him from behind, some tall grass. He was frightened. If he hadn't been so frightened, he could have made the lion disappear. Or he could have wished himself safe at home with his father and mother. He could have wished the lion would turn into a butterfly or a daisy or a gnat. He could have wished many things, but he panicked and he couldn't think clearly. Another time for you to stop and, and talk to your child about what would you do? Do you think you'd be panicking? What does it mean to panic? Show me your face. What does it mean to be panicked? I wish I were a rock, he said. And he became a rock. The lion came pounding over, sniffed the rock a hundred times. He walked around and around it and went away, confused, perplexed, puzzled and bewildered. Wow, there's some vocabulary, guys. All of those words, bewildered, puzzled, perplexed, confused, they kind of all mean the same thing. And if I have a visual to share, there you go. <laughs> That's what that lion looked like, right? He 
said, I, the lion said, I saw that little donkey as clear as day. Maybe I'm going crazy, he muttered. So we're not going to read any more. That means you have to go home and read the rest of it to your child to find out what happened to Sylvester. Because um, right now he's a rock. So you're not going to know until you go home and read the rest of the story. Um, but the whole idea was to talk about how important it was to look at the, the vocabulary first, read through the book to find out what you need to, you might need to do a little homework before you're reading so that you can share some of the vocabulary with your child. All right. Okay. So, um, ultimately, we need to reinforce this idea of reading aloud. And the way that our days are mapped out in schools, the time that educators are given to read aloud is less and less and less each year. But the significance and the impact of it doesn't change. In fact, it increases as we build more meaning and more access to these books. Um, February 1st is World Read Aloud Day. Just as an FYI, principals, just, just to keep that in, in mind. Um, but it would be a great thing to have to do as a school community and, and families as well to take time. If, if for no other day the rest of the year, maybe on February 1st, you'll make a few minutes to read. In your folders on your left-hand side, I think that's correct, there is a packet that says read aloud, read aloud for 15 minutes. That has all kinds of resources and information, both in English and Spanish, all about the significance of a read aloud, tips for reading aloud, um, probably more than you want, posters about reading aloud, etc. But I wanted to give you some resources too to take with you um, so that you can also share the significance of this of reading aloud. So let me tell you some of the major um, reasons that research shows that read aloud is so important. First and foremost, it promotes language development and early literacy skills. There's something called the 300 million word gap. And what, um, what that means is that children who have not been exposed to literature, and this often happens in low income communities, um, come to school with a 300 million word gap because children's literature is so rich in vocabulary um, that if they're not receiving any of that exposure and they're not being talked to, starting school is that much harder because they're that far behind with their, their vocabulary and their language development. Reading aloud helps model fluent reading. It improves long-term reading success and it helps them expand their vocabulary, right? It gives them familiarity with the printed word, which is something that you have to be familiar with for the rest of your life. That's a life skill. It also promotes storytelling and comprehension. And it reinforces, if your children see you reading aloud to them, it reinforces that reading is valuable. I am a guilty parent of telling my kids to go read their books, right? And then picking up my phone and doing things on my phone. Um, and so reading aloud, the, the amount of time spent reading aloud is less and less is the amount of time we are more connected. And so there's a thing in there that's called, says disconnect to connect. And that, for me, was a huge eye-opener. I am so guilty that I'll go sit in my, my child's room while she reads on her own, but I'm still doing work or something on my phone. I need to disconnect and make sure that reading is just as important. Especially for our little guys in our Title I communities, reading, reading books takes children to places they've never been. It builds awareness and empathy, and this goes all along with making sure um, the book access we provide for them is full of diversity and equity and um, just how the importance of a diverse classroom library or home library is. Reading helps children cope during times of stress and anxiety. Kids are able to often connect with characters in a way that allows them to deal with things going on in their own lives without ever even having to talk about it. And that is, that's very powerful. Uh, it helps them experience the joy of story and obviously builds motivation, curiosity, and memory. So, you go. <laughs> I want you to think before, before I turn this video on, think about whether or not this child has been read to. Um, we definitely know that it's never too early. Whoops. <laughs> so 
So it's never too early. And, and do you think that child has been exposed to someone reading to them? They know how to hold the book. It looks like they were tracking and, and definitely um, modeling the, the words. Okay. So ultimately, books matter. And we decided also to do this presentation tonight based on the location of our meeting as well. We are in the, in the library. And the library, libraries in general are an extremely underutilized resource for communities, for families, for schools even. And so this is sort of switching a little bit, switching gears slightly now from just talking about read aloud strategies and the power of read aloud, looking at the big picture of why books are so important for a community. And it kind of links together. How many of you have heard of a book desert before? A food desert? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what's a food desert? It's where you can be in an urban area or a rural area and there just isn't an access to fresh food. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, most of our communities here in Queen Anne's County, especially in our, our Title I areas, we are, not, we are often in a food desert where they're traveling 20 to 30 miles to get to the closest source of fresh food. But we are definitely in a book desert. And so what that means is that they don't have access to meaningful books other than when they're at school. When they have access to books that mean something to them or of high interest, then they are more likely to read it. Um, it's access to quality books. The other thing is that a lot of our students live in de facto book deserts as well because the reading is entirely controlled and managed by the adults in those buildings. So that their access is, it's not independent individual access, it's controlled by the adults. And we are the ones, when offered an opportunity to read, it's an entirely controlled situation. It's never self-selected. So even with not having books in the home, a lot of our communities, too, even fall into that de facto book desert of where the adults are controlling the situation. Um, access to books and the encouragement of the habit of reading, these two things are first and most necessary steps in education. And librarians, teachers, and parents all over the country know it. It's our children's right, and it's also our best hope and their best hope for the future. They've got to have, they need books in their classroom. They need books in their school libraries. They need books, and they need access to public libraries as well, and book ownership at home. And time after time, as the gap to, in book access perpetuates, great inequalities between low income and middle and in their low-income students and their middle-income peers. Um, so we as schools continue to push reading intervention programs, but again, that's a very controlled situation. And even though they're helpful, there's little evidence that the long-term positive effect of those programs can really influence the reading achievement and reading motivation. They've got to have it's twofold. Interventions are great, but they also have to have this individual access to books. So studies show that physical access to books makes all the difference. Um, like I said, part of tonight, the purpose of tonight was talking a little bit about fostering relationships between families and libraries. So we do have a system in our county where every child has access to a library card based on their computer ID number. It's a matter of getting online and filling out the correct paperwork and so on. But we don't explain that to a lot of families. Um, part of it now, I think, is part of the InfoSnap process too, and it kind of just brushes through it. I have some um, library card applications up here if any of you do not have them. But also families who need free access to books are often a little bit nervous to go into a library because they're not sure they have the necessary documentation. They're worried about the risk of library fines. Um, they're worried about losing or damaging the materials. They're worried about the home language differences. Um, they don't have the transportation to get there. and. Children who suffer from literacy um, deficiencies most often have caregivers who struggle too. So those parents are probably less likely to take advantage of a public library. But this is part where we need to tie in more and make a stronger relationship between our public libraries and our schools, rethinking ways we can help families cover fines if they were to come up and, and sort of encourage the partnership that already exists and the act, free access to books that is there, because obviously we know books are expensive. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for our educators especially and think about ways that you're encouraging um, a relationship between your classroom and the public libraries. Public librarians are 
wonderful. I used to use them all the time in my classroom. If I was going to do a unit on such and such, I would go check out every book possible at the public library, and they're more than happy to help you find those things as well. Same if you have at home families, if you have children who are so interested in something, ask the librarian. They can give you every book under the sun related to that topic. Um, children need to read between 12 and 15 books to offset summer reading loss. And even it shows for older children from third through high school, reading four or five books can pre prevent um, significant reading skill decline. So in the summers, we don't have access to our classroom libraries. We don't have access to those books at school. So that public library becomes even more important. But fostering those habits during the year so that it continues through the summer is very significant. Um, so this is kind of our change in action, right? This is where I need your help is helping create that school family reading community. Providing access to books and giving students families choice is critical if we want our students and their families to become avid, passionate, engaged readers. We've got to get books in homes and we have to bring back the read alouds. Remember, the child too is going to go home and say, my teacher said that reading aloud is important to me. Mom, Mom, will you take five minutes and read to me? Please read to me. All that's going to be reinforced on both ends, right? So it's got to be that partnership, stressing those. And I can say, I'm all about just giving books, right? Because honestly, I'd rather lose a book than a child when it comes down to that. So, so what if they don't bring the book back to the classroom library? It's not the end of the world. A lot of times I know that becomes a real stressful thing for educators because they're so worried about whether or not that book's going to come, come back. But you will see kids, that's the only book that they have in their house that is the most precious item to them. Um, <clears throat> so again, this just once again reiterates the power of book access. In the back of behind another resource in there is a list of websites and blogs and things that um, give you all kinds of book lists that promote diversity, embrace um, equity, that I know sometimes parents or families have difficulty um, picking out books. And so there's, it's a, there's, a website, there's a list of websites in there that give you lots of places to look for great books for both our young children and our YA, our young adult audience. Um, and really, this is a simple thing, try and create book baskets wherever families with kids might be gathering. So my Sudlersville Dad's Father Figure Club, they just distributed a bunch of baskets of books for me in the North County to the local restaurants, to the Millington Laundromat, um, the post office, several other places there so that when kids are sitting and waiting, they can read. These are just some facts for you to look at. I won't read them all to you, but it gives you some idea of how critical it is to get those books in their hands as early as possible. I thought that was pretty amazing in the first few, few, few years of life, the child's brain builds 700 connections per second. Mm -hmm. Just to think of the opportunity that you have at that, mm -hmm. that point in their life. Mm -hmm. There's lots of great, if you're like me and a bit of a nerd and like to read professional development type books, there's lots of great things. I, I actually recently just read one, it's the best one I've read in a long time, called The Game Changer. Mm -hmm by Colby Sharp, um, and he's a teacher, and it just talks about book access and things, and it just was, it wasn't anything new, it was just the way that he said it, and it was made me rethink again all the ways I wish I could just get as many books out there, um, but this one's along with books. Books help build communities, strengthen families, enhance school environments, and enrich children's pathways to reading in a wondrous way by sending the clear message that all children and their families belong and a future filled with hope and promise begins with books at home. Because sometimes that idea of hope only exists in books for a lot of our, a lot of our students, a lot of our kids. Um, so, earlier this year was one of my Ohana newsletters and um, while I'm thinking about that, I included in your folder my most recent Ohana newsletter. I know it goes out to all the school communities on their 
on email, and some and some of the schools send it out by paper access anyway. But I wanted to make sure that you all knew what it looked like, and that you were having an opportunity to read it earlier in the year before Christmas. I did a big thing about the gift of giving a book as one of the Ohana newsletters. Um, this year, it's about your own family, or this month, it's about your own family narrative. But books make gift, great gifts because they have whole worlds inside of them. And I think that is so true. And it's much cheaper to buy somebody a book than it is to buy them the whole world. So finally, this ties in to um, at the last district um, family action team meeting, one of the things that came up on our evaluations and we talked a little bit about was that idea of family inclusive language. And since then, I have gone to um, my Title I schools and done a professional de development with the educators in those schools on using family inclusive language, gender neutral language, low literacy language, um, and those educators, teachers, all received a copy of the family book because this is a book that promotes um, family inclusive language. So we wanted to give all of you one of these as well. Todd Parr is one of my favorite children's authors because he talks about big picture ideas in a really simple, easy to understand type of way. So I wanted to give you all a copy of the family book too um, because it's an, an amazing tool for any age to just talk about the diversity found in families and how to be inclusive of all those different types of families. <laughs> <laughs>